Hello and welcome to Aging Well, a production of Somerville Cambridge Elder Services. I'm Nathan Lamb and with me today is my fantastic guest, Nora Alwate. And uh, today we're going to talk about elder abuse and protective services, mm -hmm. uh, elder protective services at Somerville Cambridge Elder Services. Um, so I guess to start, um, can you tell me a little bit about what elder abuse is? Yeah, um, there's four different types of elder abuse. Um, one of them is, uh, so there's abuse, self-neglect, neglect, and financial exploitation. Those are the four big categories. Physical abuse. Physi well, there's abuse, there's physical abuse, sexual abuse, and also emotional abuse. So Dif three different, yeah. different types of abuse. And then the neglect, the financial exploitation, and the self-neglect. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, and that's for people who are over age 60? Yes. And is this a fairly common problem? It is very common. Unfortunately, it's not brought to our attention very frequently. I think as few as one in 14 elder abuse cases are brought to the attention of authorities. Is there, a, and is there any reason in particular that so many of them go unreported? Yeah, I think there's a lot of lack of knowledge about what elder abuse is. Uh, many people think of grandma and don't think that anybody would do anything harmful to her, which is kind of understandable, but it's not actually the case. Well, the good news is that you are extremely knowledgeable on this topic, and you're going to share a lot of knowledge with us today on this very topic. Mm -hmm. uh, how about we sort of dig into each of the different types of elder abuse, uh, starting with the three different types of abuse. Can you tell me a little bit more about yeah. what those are like? Sure, yeah. Um, so the first one is physical abuse. That's the one that most people tend to think of when they think of elder abuse. That would be oftentimes physical symptoms. You could see bruises. Um, there's also, it includes pushing. Um, it can include pinching. It can include threats as well, which people don't think of. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's generally considered um, the intentional infliction of harm on somebody. And that would include the threat, threats to yes, harm Yes, exactly, somebody. yeah. Um, and the, is that the emotional verbal, is that slightly different? It is. Um, it's also intentional, so the, the there has to be intent to cause harm, um, but there has to be some sort of impact on the elder. So we often see s sometimes families are very loud and they yell at each other mm -hmm. um, and there's no impact on the elder. So they might yell back and that's just how they engage. But there's also circumstances where somebody's yelling and it scares the elder and that's where we would get involved. Absolutely. So you're talking about em emotional injury or... Yes mental anguish where they're, you know, harassing or humiliating yeah. them. Like name calling is a big one, Absolutely. putting down. And, it, and it's to the extent that it affects the uh, victim. Exactly. Um, and then there's the sexual abuse. Yeah, that's unwanted physical contact, um, sexual contact. It can also include harmful genital practices, so overcleaning, being kind of aggressive in their cleaning, if that causes any kind of harm. Mm -hmm. um, that can also be groping, accidentally touching. Sometimes you get that between residents and apartment complexes where um, somebody will go in to kiss or uh, touch private areas that's mm -hmm. unwanted. Absolutely, so those are abuse. Mm -hmm. And the next one is neglect. Can we talk a little bit about what that yeah. entails? Yeah, neglect is a fairly common one that we get. It is the, it's generally considered uh, neglect by caregiver. So somebody that's in the caregiving role, they don't have to live in the home. Um, they could be a caregiver that's lives uh, in another city, but they're still providing the caregiver duties. Um, it's the, uh, let's see. It's the, um, yes. <laughs> it, it's the inability to meet um, an elder's basic needs. So things like shelter, medical care, personal care, um, paying bills. Eating. Eating, yes, <laughs> big one. And it doesn't have to be intentional. It doesn't, and oftentimes it's not. It's caregivers that have maybe they're stretched a little bit too thin and need more help. Well, that's a lot of what we see. Absolutely. Um, and then financial exploitation. Yeah, that's un unauthorized use of uh, an elder's finances, but it's not always unauthorized. Sometimes elders are willingly giving away their money mm -hmm. and putting themselves at risks. And we see a lot of that where people are giving away their money, whether it be by scams or um, maybe to an adult child, 
trying to help them out, but it puts them at some kind of risk. So there has to be generally some kind of harm that's coming to the elder. That, But if they have capacity and are willing to give the money away, is there anything you can do about that? Uh, oftentimes, no. We would go down and try to talk with them to see if there's anything we can do to help. Maybe, um, maybe they need help budgeting or managing their finances. We would try to do that and maybe Converse, have a conversation about how they can reduce the harm to themselves, but if they have the ability to make decisions for themselves and are making poor decisions, they do have the right to do that, even if we don't think it's the best decision. And that speaks to some of the uh, instances where elder protective services is different than protective services for young people, which we're going to get to later in the discussion. Yes. Some of the misconceptions that people have about what you guys do. And then the last one was self-neglect. Yeah, self-neglect is one of the biggest categories that we have um, that we see at Elder Protective Services. Um, I think well over half of our reports are self-neglect and people don't often think of it as a form of elder abuse. And it's the overall definition would be the inability to meet their basic needs. So shelter, food, uh, medical care, personal care, just being able to take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. It can include hoarding, which a lot of people don't think of. Mm -hmm. Anything that puts them at risk. So evictions, we do a lot of those. I see uh, statistics. Well, you don't actually evict people. You're no. more helping them yes, exactly. where they're in that situation. Uh, it says here, according to numbers you gave me, more than half of the uh, allegations of elder abuse were self-neglect yes. in 2015. So we get a lot of them. Mm -hmm. Seems like that's quite a bit. Now, it, it's interesting in that a lot of it doesn't go reported. So I guess sometimes it's incumbent on people who want to help to be able to look for warning signs of people mm. who are being abused. Can you give me some general ideas of what these warning signs look like if yeah. you think that there's elder abuse versus something that would not be more likely? Like, yeah. what's a common sign you see and then what's a common misconception sign you see? Okay, so a common sign, um, maybe an elder that you're familiar with, maybe in your neighborhood, all of a sudden is not able to take care of themselves, they're not showering, uh, maybe their mobility's changed significantly, they don't remember you anymore. Um, it can be they stop taking care of their yard and you can see stuff coming out from the inside, mm -hmm. not necessarily just taking care of their yard because that wouldn't be our um, area, but. But it might be a sign. Exactly, yeah. That it's, it's a change mm -hmm. that, that um, yeah may may indicate that something is is a mess yeah um, definitely look for changes that's the the biggest warning sign you can keep an eye out for is a significant change in behavior or anything else and we're always welcoming calls absolutely um, and I think one of the things that maybe would be a good thing too to sort of differentiate what are some things that people think that are warning signs but are not? And you have to tell people, I'm, I'm very sorry, but yeah. that's not actually. We get calls at Protective Services about concerns that something could happen. And unfortunately, the role of Protective Services is such that we res generally respond to issues. So it's imminent risk. So if somebody could fall, we understand that that's concerning, but it's not necessarily falling under our category. Um, but if they are starting to look unsteady on their feet, we would see that as a concern. Absolutely. And in our next segment, uh, we'll get to a little bit of how um, Elder Protective Services gets involved and helps people in these circumstances. Hello and welcome back to Aging Well, a production of Somerville Cambridge Elder Services. My name is Nathan Lamb, and with me here today is Nora Alwate, who is our awesome expert on elder abuse and protective services. Uh, so yes, let's uh, get back to that. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about protective services at Somerville Cambridge Elder Services and what uh, you do? Yeah, definitely. Um, so every state actually has a federal mandate to have some sort of elder protective services program. Um, it oversees people age 60 and over that are at some kind of risk. We kind of discuss the different kinds of elder abuse. Um, so we respond, we try to alleviate or prevent any kind of harm to an elder. So you provide um, elder protective services for Somerville and Cambridge. Mm -hmm. um, where do a lot of the reports come from? Are these people in the community? Are these family members? Uh, 
where do you do you get a fair volume of reports and where do they come from? We do get a lot of reports. I believe in 2015 we got something around 420, I believe. So a lot of reports. Many are um, providers, so medical um, providers in some capacity, social workers, police. But we also get a lot of calls from family members, uh, neighbors, um, EMTs. Anybody can call us, literally anybody. We welcome calls from anybody. And when somebody calls and reports, their identity is kept confidential? Exactly. We can't reveal the name of the reporter. We actually don't confirm or deny who the reporter is, so they can keep guessing, um, and we'll never say it. And so it's you... It's protected by law. Oh, okay. I forgot to mention. No, no, that's important yeah, to is, know. Yeah. So one thing that I do want to ask about is it's protective services, but it's not preventative services. So okay. do you get a fair amount of cases where you have to tell people that, like, what sort of circumstances can you help, and then which ones can you not? So reports that are um, called into us, if they don't fall under our criteria, they'd be screened out, but we would always offer some kind of um, supportive services. So that would be circumstances where maybe somebody calls and they're concerned about an elder that something could happen but hasn't happened yet. Like they could fall, um, they could potentially not pay their bills, they could miss their medical appointments, they maybe are missing their medications but there's no evidence of it. So we ask, when people do call we ask a lot of questions to try to determine if there is evidence or enough evidence to kind of support that something is happening. Mm -hmm. And once the person has made the call and the screening process begins, where do things go from there? If it's screened in, um, it would be assigned to a worker like myself. There's five of us. Um, we respond to the elder. So first we would make contact with the reporter. So somebody that called us, we'd let them know that the case is assigned to us. So I'd say it's signed to Nora. Um, and that I'm going to make contact with the elder, sort of give an idea of what we're going to do. So the first after that person, that contact, the next contact is with the elder. We either call in advance to try to schedule something, but oftentimes we'll go unannounced so that they can't refuse us. Mm -hmm. We're generally pretty successful in getting in. And once you have met with the elder, how does that process go? Are you making an assessment while you're meeting with them yes. for, um, in, in yeah. those terms? Yeah, how exactly. Does that go? So when we um, get with the elder, my approach often is to say, I introduce myself, I'm Nora with Somerville Cambridge Elder Services, I'm a social worker, I happen to work in the Department of Protective Services, and we respond to concerns about elders that are at some kind of risk, and my job is to come see how you're doing and how I can help. That's how I introduce it. How is that usually received? Or is, do 99% say no, there's no problem? <laughs> or? Um, I would say maybe... A lot of people will at least talk with us, mm -hmm. um, engage in a conversation. Some people get insulted that we're out there. Um, it's generally the older, like 90 plus, that are more insulted that we're there. I don't mm -hmm. think that they're familiar with protective services or even um, Somerville Cambridge Elder Services. Mm -hmm. And so you have the meeting with the elder. Then what happens from there? So during the meeting, we try to assess their capacity. So we would um, talk with them about the concerns. Sometimes we see what their opinion is on it. Um, some people will acknowledge that this issue is happening and say, I know it's kind of risky, but I'm okay with it. Um, we would talk about what would happen if they do take action to prevent whatever the abuse is. Um, if they don't take action, what would happen? So we try to make sure that they understand um, what the consequences are if they don't do something or the benefits if they do work with us. Um, if they consent to work with us, so we try to talk with as many people as they're comfortable with us talking to. So it would be doctors, sometimes children, building managers, anybody that knows the elder well, case managers at Somerville Cambridge Elder Services, mm -hmm. and try to get a good idea of what's going on in the elder's life. Mm -hmm. So there's the, the assessment and understanding, and then there actually comes the action after that yes. of the interventions. And how do those generally play out? Do you have some guiding principles on how you try and approach yeah. And interventions. Yeah. So if it's um, if we do our investigation and we determine that there's more evidence than not that something happened, so more evidence than not that an elder's being evicted or they're not taking their medications, um, not making medical appointments, the list could go on. Um, we work with the elder to develop some kind of plan to prevent it from happening in the future, and it is really a collaborative process. We don't 
do things and implement them without their permission. So it, it's very collaborative, and that's like a very strong. Um, I don't know the word I'm looking for. Principle. Principle. Yeah. Principle for it. <laughs> yeah. And there's also an, an element of assessing their capacity to make decisions. Mm -hmm. How important is that to what you do? That's a major uh, part of our job is assessing that. We the there's certain principles that Protective Services uh, operates by, and one of them is the right to self-determination. So if an elder um, has the capacity to make decisions for themselves, they understand the consequences, they have the right to make decisions for their life, whether that's good decisions or not so good decisions. Um, oftentimes, if they're making poor decisions, it's providers, myself, case managers, medical providers, anybody you can think of, um, we all think maybe they could make better choices, but because they have the ability to make decisions for themselves, we have to respect their right. And we do. And oftentimes that can also be a reason that protective services gets involved is that we advocate for people's rights and their right to make decisions for themselves. So sometimes we're on the end where we're telling medical providers that we're on the elder side and we want to respect their wishes as much as possible. Mm. And when it comes to actually implementing the interventions, uh, are there any guiding principles such as making them unobtrusive um, or how does that usually yeah. unfold when you, you put together this plan for how to address things? We always try to do the least restrictive possible. So um, we try to keep an elder where they want to be. If they want to be home, we would keep them there if, as, as, if we could. Mm -hmm. And if they want to go to a maybe more structured environment but not quite nursing home, there's assisted living, there's other options. Um, Somerville Cambridge Elder Services is able to provide a lot of support for elders in their home. We mm -hmm. even have el elders that require nursing home care and they're able to stay home. 24-hour care, we, they can stay there and it's, it's actually quite wonderful. The home care, mm -hmm. absolutely helping people live in the setting of their choice. Exactly. Very big. Um, or possibly getting in touch with the authorities if appropriate. Does that happen from time to time? Yeah, so there are certain circumstances where we might have to report to the district attorney. We, we do talk with an elder in advance about that. So serious physical abuse, or most physical abuse, if it's serious emotional abuse or sexual abuse, it is reported to the district attorney. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they get involved, sometimes they don't. Um, Sometimes if an elder lacks capacity and is at risk, maybe a caregiver is not doing what they're supposed to, mm -hmm. then we have to go to court. It's pretty rare. Um, we'll go for guardianship on rare occasions. We try to avoid that as much as possible. Absolutely. Well, I think that covers it pretty well. You know, you sort of uh, talked around a couple of the um, misconceptions that people have, and that's something that we're going to take up in our next segment. Uh, so, in a few minutes we'll be back for segment three. Great. And welcome back to Aging Well, a production of Summer Real Cambridge Elder Services. I'm Nathan Lamb, and with me today is our outstanding Elder Protective Services expert, Nora Alwatwade. Thank you for joining us today. I'm so happy to be here. I have learned a ton about elder abuse and protective services, and now we are going to learn a little bit about some of the misconceptions. It, is, is it a real thing that people won't call because of misconceptions about elder protective services and what you do? Yeah, actually a lot of people don't call us because they're either fearful that we would say who called us. Sometimes, um, other times people don't call us because they don't know what we do. They don't want to make things worse for our family. Um, we've had, actually people have told us that, they don't want to call, they worry that we're going to go in and kind of incite more drama within the family and that's not at all how we approach things. Absolutely. And there probably also is this concern about losing control of the situation. Yeah. Where, because um, you hear protective services, you think of a Child. young person who isn't really given a choice, but as we've discussed earlier in the segment, uh, the capacity to make decisions is, is huge for what you guys do. It is, yeah. Some people that some people do get concerned um, when they hear our title and they do think we're going to come in and rip them out of their home and put them in a nursing home and that's the furthest thing from the truth. That's not at all what we want to do to elders. We want to go in and do anything we can to keep them home and as independent as possible. Our goal is often um, to keep them as safe as possible and harm reduction. So we don't go in and fix everything. Um, sometimes people want us to do that, but we often can't do, accomplish that goal 
often it's unreasonable. Mm -hmm. um, we do the best we can to make them as safe as humanly possible in their home. So it can be any kind of number of interventions, sometimes lifeline, 911 cell phone. Sometimes it's just making sure a neighbor checks on them periodically. Meals on Wheels is a good protective factor that we try to put in. Mm -hmm. So anything we can do to keep them independent, home if that's where they want to be, and safe. And there's, is there ever concerns that you won't regard the wishes of the people who, who call? That's another one where they might feel like, um, you know, you guys are going to come in and call in a team of investigators and all these things. It's not really how it works. No, not at all. Um, so if we get a report of concern and Protective Services is going to respond, we go out as social workers. We do anything we can. We, we approach the situation as social workers. We try to be friendly, obviously, and welcoming and try to dispel any concerns about our name right away. And it's interesting because these misconceptions, people might not have the most realistic expectations when they do call. Do you ever see frustration from people who call protective services expecting one thing only to find that it's a little different? Yeah, unfortunately that happens a lot. People do call us because they are concerned about an elder. We understand that um, they might want us to go in and fix things or make things better right away and we can't often do that. Um, they often don't know that we do respect elders' wishes, that they have the right to tell us whether they want to work with us or not. Um, elders also have the right to let us talk with whoever they want to, so even if we are involved, we can't always tell the person that called us what's going on and that can be a source of frustration. Also a source of frustration if Protective Services closes the case that can... Due to the wishes of the yeah. person who's... Exactly, yeah. Wow. So, and you can close the case and potentially not tell the person who reported it, or do you let the person who reported it know that it was closed if you had to close it? It kind of varies from case to case. Um, if it's a, a provider of some sort, we do try to notify them that the case is being closed and they would get a, a mailing letting them know, but if it's family, uh, sometimes the call doesn't get through to them that we close the case, but they can always call and find out if it's still open and active. We can say that. And I hear that people are often surprised to find out how small the Protective Services yeah. Department is. Are they expecting a large operation? How big are you? Uh, well, there's only five workers um, in our department right now. We have a supervisor that's um, a master's in social work, and then we have our director. So it's only seven people. Mm -hmm. The five protective service workers, three of us are clinical social workers. One has their master's in counseling, and the other we coerced to come over from home care into our department. Mm -hmm. So we all have some experience with either elders in subcapacity, um, some with mental health, or just home care, and know the system really well, and that's been really helpful. Mm, absolutely. And I guess just to wrap it up, uh, what are some of the more rewarding aspects of this work for you? Having, how long have you been involved with? Uh, at, some, at Somerville, Cambridge, I've been for a little over three years now, mm -hmm. almost three and a half years. And I have previously done protective services type work um, in another state. So I've been involved in it for a while. I love it. Uh, my favorite parts probably are being able to advocate for elders' wishes. I don't think a lot of people, sometimes people, well-intentioned people, kind of don't acknowledge elders' wishes. They kind of impose their will on them. And I pride myself on not doing that, and I pride myself on being a strong advocate for them. And I, I really like that. I love being able to keep people home and safe, uh, housed if possible, preventing eviction. I just like my job a lot. Maybe we could change it to protective advocacy services. Yeah. That kind of has a more positive uh, tilt to it. And if people decide that they want to call, uh, is it Monday through Friday 9 to 5? Or so, Yes, yeah, so you can call Monday through Friday 9 to 5 and you would reach one of us five protective service workers. We All of us do intake shifts, but we are available um, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There's a hotline that does holidays and after hours. We'll put, we make sure that you have the number. All right. And is there anything else that you'd like to add? I don't think so. And we covered a lot of ground yeah. today. I, I really want to thank you for coming in, Nora. It's been fantastic having you on the show. So happy Hopefully, to be here. Yeah, it's been, it's been fun. Hopefully uh, at some point we'll come back and talk some more about protective services. Thanks again. Love to. Thank you.